All right, so I have a special guest here with us today. I am super excited to introduce Dr. Susan David. So Dr. Susan David is a renowned psychologist and expert on emotions, happiness, and achievement. Her number one Wall Street Journal bestselling book, Emotional Agility, provides practical tools. We love our practical tools here um, to help us navigate our inner worlds, our everyday thoughts, emotions, and self stories. This is the single most important determinant. Um, so Susan believes myself included of our life's success. Um, after you listen to this video, you might want to check out Susan's amazing Ted talk um, and join the millions of others around the world who have listened to her speak on her concept of emotional agility. So welcome, Susan. Thank you so much for sharing your time and energy with us here today. Thank you. I'm so delighted to be with you. We're super excited to hear from you. So I think a good starting point, um, because I know in my work, I, I see and hear um, these, these myths, as I like to call them, around our emotions that a lot of us believe to be true. And I think one of the predominant ones that I'm up against a lot in terms of the work is this idea that stress or that negative feelings, you know, in their entirety are something that should be avoided. And any of us who have stress in our lives or who feel negative experiences or emotions are somehow wrong or bad, that ultimately the goal is to avoid these such things. So I wanted to hear a little bit from you on what you make of this idea. Um, why is it that so many of us believe that stress is to be avoided? Um, and what is your actual belief in terms of what stress and what the role of it is in our day to day lives? So let's start off with the basis of the question, which I think is so important, which is this idea of difficult emotions. Uh, and stress might be one of those experiences, but we have such a full range of emotions. And some of these are, you know, not necessarily about stress, but things like sadness or guilt or, um, you know, feelings of discomfort. And what's happened really socially, and there's a long history to this, is that these emotions have become seen as negative and therefore bad. And there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, you know, I describe a little bit in my work about how when I was doing my PhD on this topic, it was actually like extraordinarily difficult for me to get an advisor who would advise me in work on emotions, which is bizarre because this is in a psychology department. Because even at that time, emotions were seen as almost like either disruptive or the byproduct or end product of our experience. And what I mean by that is that if we got everything else right in terms of our thoughts and in terms of our actions, that our emotions would kind of sort themselves out. And really, you know, part of the, the history that we see of almost um, maligning emotions is in psychology, but we also see this in society more broadly. You know, this idea that emotions, especially tough emotions, are associated with uh, being irrational, they've become feminized, and this is extraordinarily destructive. So from a psychological perspective, we know that our emotions have evolved, all of our emotions have evolved to help us to adapt. So when we are experiencing something that feels disconnected with our values or disconnected with who we want to be in our lives, we will often have difficult emotions. And when we then see these emotions as being, oh, these are distractions, these are negative, I've got to be positive, what we actually do is we shut ourselves off mm -hmm. from the learning and the value that comes from those difficult emotions. So in, in short order, what we do when we close ourselves off from difficult emotions is we actually close the door to our ability to adapt and thrive in our lives. And so one of the core aspects of my work is really speaking to this idea that tough emotions are actually part of our contract with life. <laughs> We don't get to have a meaningful career or to raise a family or to leave the world a better place without stress and discomfort. You know, the discomfort is actually the price of admission <laughs> to a meaningful life. 
And so this is really the foundational to my work and what, what you know, and I know we've, we share this idea in many ways is that what this really pushes up against is avoidance of difficult emotions, but also systemic avoidance of difficult emotions that can often find its way through in, you know, what has come to be called uh, toxic positivity, you yes. know, this idea that like, mm -hmm. you've just got to be positive. Um, it is profoundly erosive of our individual well-being and our community well-being when we are not able to engage effectively with difficult emotions. Yeah, absolutely. And this idea, I'm, I'm happy you're bringing this up, you know, toxic positivity, spiritual bypassing. Really interestingly, I had a giggle, uh, Susan, and I'm, I'm sure it's not a, a joking matter when you're sharing your, your time in grad school, trying to get someone desperately to, to help you do the research on around emotions, um, sharing obviously a very similar experience myself. And mine was around when I was at that time, um, or, uh, um, trying to to advocate that was the word i was trying to find advocate for um what i believed was to be the utilitary value of mindfulness of ap applicable approaches around emotional experiences awareness of our emotions so somewhat similar though again i was very much told at that time that that wasn't a fruitful um area of research which is, and I, yeah which is mind-blowing and brings us to i think in the field kind of as as a whole um our beliefs and this is emblematic in the gold standard of treatment which is cbt this idea right that if we just change our thoughts enough we can reframe our complete emotional experiences like you're offering become stress-free because it's to be avoided um and i see that at the system level um in yes. terms of how the field is 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 orchestrated with that being the top protocol those of us in the field and as you know cl um, clients in the field as well come to see that that doesn't necessarily work um and i also see this in individuals um, those of us who, you know, maybe at times in our past experiences have had emotions that have felt debilitating or the word that comes yeah. up a lot in my community, overwhelming. Um, so I think we have two roads where we do get messages. One is the, the systemic road where we're taught directly or indirectly that some feelings are to be avoided or yeah. are a marker that something is wrong with us. And then we have the individual pathway where some of us very real lived experiences of being overwhelmed by our own emotions in the past do then seek to avoid them out of likely fear or some version of you know discomfort of what will happen if I'm overwhelmed again. So I think that's what's really important here. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of the individual pathway, because I do think sometimes we we have had emotionally overwhelming experiences that we seek to avoid into a future. Absolutely. And I think that um, it's a it's a both end. And really what I mean by this is so many of our responses to our individual emotions and to our individual lived experience are also conveyed by what is called uh, display rules. So, you know, display rules are the rules that often implicitly and sometimes explicitly convey to people mm -hmm. this emotion is okay and not okay. Mm -hmm. And so what can, that can lead people into doing is almost being in a kind of emotional house of mirrors where not only are you now experiencing the emotion, but you are also not able to extricate yourself from this very real messaging that exists around emotions. And I'll give you an example of like what this looks like. And it's actually very interesting historically when we think about these ideas, because we spoke about them within psychology. Um, but there's, there's a fairly interesting body of research looking at the gendered ideas that come about around emotions. And how, you know, if you think about education and how education historically was traditionally open to males mm -hmm. and what could be taught in, <clears throat> excuse me, and what could be taught in formal education was logic, strategy, mathematics, sciences. So then what becomes associated with uh, the intangible stuff, <laughs> the feminine stuff is the part of education that's not open to women. And so what happens is femininity emotions get connected in this way. And so what you land up then having is this really interesting a narrative in society that finds its way into the individual, which is that 
Um, emotions are logical. They are they're good emotions and bad emotions. They're to be avoided. And then what happens as we start connecting in with generational experiences and generational trauma is how these display rules find their way into families mm -hmm. where your very real experience as a child of maybe being unseen or of um, having something that feels really difficult to you is met with a response often by a caregiver or a parent that says something like, you know, if you keep crying, I'll give you something to cry about. Um, that says, if you feel angry, go to your room and come out when you've got a smile on your face. <laughs> that says, when you feel sad, we don't do sadness here. We, you know, all about joy and happiness. And so what happens is we start to learn through our childhoods how to develop skills around different emotions. And so I think that this idea that there is this individual responsiveness is really profoundly important. And it's also important to recognize that we actually have our own display rules that have often developed from when we were very young that lead us into situations where we experience something and we then gaslight ourselves we tell ourselves we're not allowed to experience it and so this is what I mean by the emotional house of mirrors and so psychologically what happens is I often think of this language and I describe this in uh, emotional agility this idea that we can often have a type one emotion and the type one emotion is the overwhelm it's mm -hmm. the stress mm -hmm. it's the disconnect it's the sadness then what we do is we layer on a type two emotion, I shouldn't <laughs> feel sad about my sadness. <laughs> and that is, that is where we start engaging in this vortex with mm -hmm. ourselves that takes us away from our values and our thriving and our flourishing and ourselves, yes. and instead leads us into a constant hustle with whether we are allowed or not allowed to feel something. Yes. yes. Vortex. I mean, I keep kind of repeating that word because I just think it it is so uh, so appropriate to use right here. Um, and a big part of the reason why I've been advocating and, you know, I love your work because it's very much aligned with this, which is really honoring the individual's experience of whatever the thing is. And historically in the field, we were we were taught to categorize experiences based on the thing itself. If it reached a certain threshold, we could label something that happened, quote unquote, traumatic, bad enough to cause negative consequences to the self. Yeah. Though the reality is, it's not, in my opinion at least, it's not necessarily a function of the thing anymore. It's how did this individual experience the thing? Did they have the resources or were they again, fallen into a state of overwhelm? And this allows for, much more of us now to honor the effects that for many of us were wounding moments in childhood that happened consistently where sometimes our feelings wholly or only certain aspects of our feelings weren't allowed the light of day or to be expressed. We continue down that vortex long enough and we do end up as an adult who's completely more often than not disconnected from the self in a very deep way. Yes. Um, I call this a version of trauma because I do think that the way that we attempt to cope to deal with that vortex, like you're saying, endlessly spiraling, exhausting ourselves, does carry very real trauma to the emotional and to the physical bodies. Um, and I love that aspect of your work. So talk to me about, I think this is where we insert this concept of emotional agility. So stress is a part of life. Feelings have adaptive you know, messengers for, messengers for us or are adaptive messengers for us. Tell us a little bit about, you know, what then emotional agility means um, and ultimately what it looks like in our day-to-day -day life. So thank you. I think that's such a powerful question. You know, and one of the things that you speak about earlier is how we can become um, disconnected with the self. And often what this can look like as it aligns with and connects with emotional agility is on the one hand, we have difficult thoughts and feelings and we push them aside. 
So we say things like, I'm not able, I'm not allowed to have those difficult thoughts and feelings. And that in a very obvious way takes us away from the self. Um, but another way we can move away from the self is by getting so stuck in our difficult thoughts and feelings mm -hmm. by, by becoming so immersed. So, th so the, the pushing away from is what I call bottling. The getting stuck in is this idea of brooding that we get so stuck in what our experience is that we, um, we develop a story around it and the story starts to own us and it starts to hook us and we are so in the story we're so immersed in the story that we are also disconnected from ourselves because we are more than our story uh we are also our wisdom i believe that every single one of us has inside of us the capacity for wisdom and calm and centeredness um we are our values we are who we want to be in the moment. And so when we get stuck in the story becoming definitional of who we are, where it starts to own us, we also start to move away from us from ourselves in a very different way. And so what is emotional agility? Uh, perhaps a good way to describe emotional agility is by its opposite, <laughs> which is emotional rigidity. Emotional rigidity is the idea that we have these difficult thoughts. I'm not good enough. Emotions, emotions of, of sadness or feelings of disconnect. And sometimes these stories, these stories about who we are, what kind of life we deserve, what kind of love we deserve. And I think what's really crucial in my work is the idea that these thoughts, emotions, and stories are actually normal, okay? Um, and really what I mean by that is that there's nothing inherently wrong or bad about any thought, emotion, or story. Fundamentally, these capacities are capacities that help us as human beings to make sense of the world. When I have an emotion that says, this feels really bad, that emotion is often saying to me, gee, this has relevance to you, this might be important here, maybe you want to pay attention. And so there's nothing inherently good or bad about any thoughts, emotions, or stories. And I think this is where my work really pushes against this mm -hmm. idea that if you have a so-called negative thought, you've got to push it aside, or if you have a so-called negative emotion, now suddenly you're a toxic person and you know you, you mustn't engage with other, you, no, these thoughts, these emotions, these stories are normal. So what defines emotional rigidity is when we start hooking into one of these ideas or stories in a way that leads it to become definitional of us. In other words, it starts to own us rather than we as human beings, as these wise capacious, breathing, beautiful, messy human beings, rather than we owning it. So what that can look like is emotional rigidity is when by default, you avoid particular triggers. Those triggers are difficult for you, but you become avoidant of whether it's uh, you know, a set of experiences, like thinking about what starts to happen in that is it, it sounds empowering, but actually what you mm -hmm. do is you systematically shrink your world. And we don't become capacious people if we have a shrunken world. We don't become capacious people if we are only able to respond to A but not B. We become capacious people when we develop our capacity to be in the world as it is, which is a fragile, imperfect, messy world. So one form of emotional rigidity is avoidance. Another form of emotional rigidity is um, autopilot, where we just kind of, I know this connects a lot with your work, mm -hmm. where we're going through our lives in a daze where we 
have uh, something that we respond to in the same way time and time again. Our partner starts in on the finances, we <laughs> leave the room. We have a difficult conversation with our children. We have this autopilot response, which is shutting down, becoming negative, stonewalling. Um, this is crucial. This is crucial because as we spoke about earlier, Nicole, so many of the stories that we have tell us that we should not be compassionate with ourselves, that we should be punishing of ourselves. And so being compassionate with yourself is really about saying, this is tough. This is messy. I'm moving into a space of discomfort and a space of potential growth. And I can't avoid it, but it is difficult. It is this is human and it's tough. So compassion is a core part of emotional agility. Another core, card, core part of emotional agility is uh, the capacity to be curious. Why curious? Because so often when we have had a challenging experience, we also have a autopilot response to that experience. We'll push it aside. We'll engage with it in a particular way we'll find ourselves telling the same story time and time again in an autopilot way. And so curiosity is really about starting to say like, I'm experiencing a, dif experiencing a difficult emotion here. What is this emotion telling me about my values? What is this emotion telling me about something that's happening at work where I'm feeling undermined and so my autopilot response is to just shut down and be quiet. But my values here of the discomfort, like what is the value that this discomfort is pointing me in the direction of? Oh, I'm feeling uncomfortable because my voice is being silenced. So what is the value that that emotion is pointing to? And this is key. Our emotions are signposts of the things that we care about. And I'm going to say that again. Yes, our exactly. emotions signpost the things that we care about. So when we experience a difficult emotion, doesn't mean every difficult emotion is signposting, but often when we experience difficult emotions, they signpost that something we care about is at stake. So if you're feeling shut down in a meeting, that might be signposting that you value voice, that you value your voice, that for too long, your voice has been unheard. And so if you can connect into that emotion with compassion and curiosity, you can then start connecting with the third core component of emotional agility, which is courage. How do I move forward in this context with courage. And so I'll just end by giving a very quick definition of emotional agility, which is emotional agility is, in essence, the ability to be with all of our difficult thoughts, emotions and stories, in ways that bring us into the present context, so that the emotion of the story isn't defining how we react in that moment, but rather other parts of ourselves are allowed to come forward. And we're allowed to and allow ourselves to move forward with courage. And so what this really means is that these thoughts, emotions, and stories are data, but they're not directives. Because I feel something difficult doesn't mean I have to act on it, doesn't mean I need to avoid the situation, doesn't mean I need to have it out with my boss. Rather, they are data, not directives. So when we're curious with our difficult emotions, we can learn from them. But what are we doing? We are not being directed by those emotions. The emotions aren't calling the shots. Rather, what we're doing is we are stepping into our values. We are saying, in this moment, in this meeting, in this conversation, what is the values-connected way that I can courageously bring myself forward? So in other words, again, you aren't acting into the overwhelm. Rather, what you're doing is you're starting to say, what is this overwhelm telling me once I've calmed myself about what's important here? And how can I step into the value that is being signaled? 
And I think this, this last part, you know, acknowledging the stepping into, you know, again, highlights the need to embody a new experience, right? It's not just enough to, to imagine or to think differently in those moments, right? To shift from that reactivity that lives in, as I say, the autopilot, right? And all of these ways that we have operated on outside of our awareness to keep us either stuffed as our go-to, right? Or brooding even for some of us as our go-to, we, we are familiar in there and we're, we're stuck and we like to just stay in there as humans. So the way out often or always is doing things differently now in that space. So even the actioning of becoming compassionate, becoming curious, becoming courageous are ways of being. And I think that's the important shift. That's what emotional agility actually means is learning how to operationalize a new way around our emotions, how to be with them, how to compassionately take the information and then reground ourselves into our values to be able to action in a new way. And I keep highlighting all of these different forms of actioning because I believe for a lot of us, we're stuck. We're stuck with increasing amounts of insight. We might even know why we brood the way we do or we avoid our emotions the way we do, yet we're still stuck doing it the way we do. And what's so valuable about your work and so incredibly important is how practical you, you talk about. Okay, well, how do I begin? I begin to cultivate curiosity and compassion, knowing that those are actions. That's a new relationship now that I need to embody with my feelings, learning how to see them for yeah. what they are. And I just keep like to highlight that because again, that disempowerment of having all of the insight of knowing why our patterns are the way they are and not being able to actually develop emotional agility, for instance, is incredibly disempowering, powerless place to be. And this is actually the way we can empower ourselves to navigate the ever-changing uncertainty of life because that's what it remains. We don't actually know what comes tomorrow. We need that agility to lie within so that we can navigate the unknown. Yeah, and I think that this is when people ask me like, you know, does your work connect with resilience? <laughs> uh, there are many, there, you know, they're, 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 they're certainly, and I can give some practical strategies around this if this is helpful, but certainly, you know, yes, you know, if you're more able to be effective with your emotions, you will be more resilient. If you're more able to unhook from difficult experiences, you'll be more resilient. But emotional agility is much more than that because emotional agility is actually about, I've used this word previously in our conversation today, but it's about developing the capaciousness as a human being, the, the open-heartedness as a human being to walk forward into the dark <laughs> rather than just go, oh my goodness, where's the light? How can I switch on the light? So to me, resilience is like often about saying, how can I switch on the light? Whereas emotional agility is about saying, the world is, is uncertain. How can I have the skills that move me forward in the dark? And, you know, Nicole, you describe so powerfully, I think, the practical aspects of my work, which is, I think if I had to really define the thread of my work and you'll see this in my TED talk that you referred to earlier which is my work is at essence about how we can better see ourselves how we can better see ourselves and see others it's very difficult to see yourself effectively and to respond effectively when you are stuck inside the jar <laughs> you know, you, you can't read the instructions when you're stuck inside the jar. And so a lot of my work is firstly about what are the capacities around how you develop self-compassion? Like, how do you actually connect with yourself? You know, even just as I'm sitting here, like thinking, you know, we are such tactile human beings and there is such power when we are feeling overwhelmed in just, you know, you can see I'm putting my hands to my chest, just grounding ourselves in a tactile way is a way that we are compassionate. So there are ways that we can start showing up to our emotions in, in very practical ways. We can also stop, start to step out of our difficult emotions, step out of our stories 
And I can give two examples of what this looks like if you think this would be of value. Please, yes. So one example uh, that, that I'll reference is just part of my work is about emotion granularity. So emotion granularity is this idea that often when we experience something difficult, we'll describe it with these very big labels. So we'll say, I'm overwhelmed, or we'll say, I'm stressed. But there's a world of difference between stress and disappointment. Stress and that knowing, knowing feeling that a relationship isn't working out. Uh, stress and the need for support. Stress and I'm just tired, I'm depleted. When we label everything as stress or overwhelm, what we do is we put all of these difficult emotions into a bucket and we then stir around that bucket, but we are unable to actually take effective action. So one of the most powerful ideas is this idea that when we become more granular, granular with our emotions, when we say, I'm calling this thing stress, I'm calling it overwhelm, but what are two other emotions? What are two other options that are coming up for me here? Oh, I'm disappointed. Oh, I'm feeling unseen. What you're starting to do is the very essence, the act of moving from the umbrella label into what are two other options. What it literally does is it changes what in psychological terms we'll call the readiness capacity of us as human beings. You know, when you start to say, I'm stressed at work. Oh my goodness, like we are, you know. Whereas when you say, I'm feeling unsupported. Already that act of labeling that emotion or that experience as unsupported starts activating what scientists call the readiness potential in our brains. This ability to say, okay, how do I get more support? Or how do I have that conversation with my friend? How do I broach this difficult topic with my loved one? So emotion granularity is foundational in our ability to actually be able to take effective action, to be able to get out of the jar. So this is what I call being able to not ignore the emotion, but to step out of it. So that's one, one example of something that's very practical. I, not, you know, sorry, and I, did, did you want to? No, I was, I'm giggling too, because I want to thank you for that example, um, because I'm someone who loved to throw historically everything into the stress bucket. And I've learned to how to differentiate. Sometimes I'm not even stressed. I'm excited. Sometimes I have a lot of things to do and they're not necessarily negative things. So as I historically just kept throwing everything into the stress bucket, I didn't give myself any opportunity to solve perhaps what was maybe solvable, such as not schedule so many appointments, get a little more sleep. If it is an exhausted, I'm tired. So for me, that was that was integral advice to learn that I am someone who just dumped everything into that catch all and that did not actually let me understand the problem or my concern in reality. And it didn't really give me a way out. And now that I've been able to get a little more to use your language granular, yeah. I've been able to actually open the door for newer solutions, how to solve the problem that was once so big because it was amorphous. It was just stress. Who knows what to do with that into something yes. that for me felt more manageable. So the whole while you were talking, I was like, like okay, well, she's calling my old <laughs> self out right now. So I just wanted to offer that here no, because I, I see examples of that in me still to this day. So getting really clear in those moments when I'm just going to say, oh, I'm stressed. No. Am I something else that can help me find a new plan forward? Yes. It, and it's so, it's so powerful. It's so powerful. And we do this in different ways and different people's umbrella label <laughs> is often again going to depend on the display rules of their experience, of their childhood, of yes. the context, of everything that's going on around them. So that's really, really important. Another aspect of being able to step out is that, that if we think about the way we often talk about our experiences, we'll say, I am sad. I am angry. Okay. I am traumatized. 
um, I am being undermined, you know, and I can give like a thousand <laughs> examples because as I mentioned earlier, these thoughts, these emotions, these experiences, I mean, if I, if I had to say to you, you know, think about why your big toe on your one foot is better than your big toe on your other foot, you know, we will all be able to come up with a reason because our minds are constantly in the mode of criticizing, judging, assessing. That's our mind doing the job that it was meant to do. So what starts to happen is one of the ways we can get stuck, we can get emotionally rigid is where we start saying something like, I am sad. I am angry. I am being undermined. It's so subtle, but a lot of my work is really about the way we language about our experience and how the way we language about our experience actually either endorses that experience in a way that keeps us stuck or endorses our experience in a way that allows us to breathe into a new way of being. And so I am sad. What are you saying when you say I am sad? You're saying I am all of me, 100% of me. There is no space. There's no space for compassion. There's no space for wisdom. There's no space for breathing or mindfulness or mm -hmm. There's no space for me to reach out my hand to my two or three-year-old who's waiting for my hand because I'm so stuck in that I am. You know, if you think about what you're doing linguistically is you are defining yourself, all of you, 100% of you, by that experience. And the example that I give or the, the, the metaphor, it's a little bit like if you go outside and there's a cloud in the sky, I am sad as you have now identified with that cloud. You know, you are the cloud. Mm -hmm. So linguistically, what we can start to do is we can start noticing our thoughts, our emotions and our stories for what they are. They are thoughts. They are emotions, they are stories, they, they are valid experiences, but they are not definitional experiences. In other words, they are not all encompassing experiences. And this is really, really important. So instead of saying I'm sad, I'm noticing that I'm feeling sad. I'm noticing that this is my I'm not good enough story what you start doing here is you're not bottling you're not pushing aside you're not avoiding but rather you are saying I am not going to be defined in my entirety by this experience and so this is this is so powerful when you start naming your thoughts your emotions and your stories for what they are thoughts emotions and stories you start creating space so I'm noticing that I'm feeling sad I'm noticing that this is my I'm not good enough story. What you start doing is you start actually creating linguistic and psychological space. Again, so you can step out of the jar. And to further that metaphor that I described earlier, as a human being, you are not your emotion. You are not the cloud. You are the sky. You know, you are the sky. You are capacious and beautiful and messy enough to have all of your clouds and to still move forward in the world with intention. It's such a, such a beautiful picture. Um, and, you know, really honoring the fullness, you know, of our experience and also honoring the, the past experiences that have shaped the way of being that many of us wake up to see, right? All of that patterning, all of that, you know, distancing or brooding, whatever it might be for us, yeah. came from someplace. So again, this doesn't yeah. mean that we, you know, are, are, are in denial of that which happened. It's part of our story, though it allows us to, to expand. And, you know, I love how you're highlighting the power of linguistics. Um, and I believe that often, the practice does begin inside our internal world, becoming that observer, seeing the language that are coloring our thoughts and creating change there before as many of us want to actualize change in real time. When now my partner says that thing and I want to expand into that space and create a new response in that moment, 
that comes once we've practiced, practice, practice, once we yes. are able to create space for ourselves, because that's what complicates, at least in my opinion, our experience of being humans. We have other people humaning around us, becoming reactive, right? Yeah. Touching yeah. our, activating our deepest wounds all in real time. And now here you hear someone like yourself and me sitting here speaking, oh, well, we need space and to be expanded in that moment. That all sounds like theory mm -hmm. that only becomes possible once we're practicing, once we're really yes. aware of how powerful our thoughts are, creating yes. space for ourselves so that the next time we now interact with another very complicated, messy human, right? We can both create this space to honor all the rest of the self that might not be in expression because we're activated or because something from our past is trying to take over. Um, though over time, we can expand that space into our day-to-day -day moments and really begin to create some change. Yes. It's it's so powerful because I think it's it's really, you know, what you spoke about just at the beginning of that observation is that you're not you're not turning your back on your past. In fact, when you notice your thoughts and feelings and experiences for what they are, you are seeing more of yourself. And the reason that I say that is because you are turning yourself towards other parts of yourself. You know, other parts of yourself that are maybe in the shadows or hidden or have been overshadowed by this difficult experience. And so that is like such, you know, such a profoundly powerful way of being. And, and you know, this idea of I am noticing, we can start practicing, but we can also start recognizing that often people will say, oh, but you know, when I, when I get caught off guard by an emotion, it's like the emotion just came out of the blue, you know, like, I don't know how to do that in the moment. Um, but what I would really encourage is the recognition that most of the times when we are caught off guard, oh, there's no off guard anything. You know, most of it is so patterned, so predictable, so autopilot that, that developing this, this uh, recognition and even this acknowledgement of like, you know, what is it in this conversation with my partner about finances or with my spouse about fi finances that always leads me into the space? Well, I've got this difficult emotion and I'm noticing this difficult emotion and I can even notice it in the midst of a conversation. I can say to myself, I'm noticing the urge to shut down. You can notice it in the moment and it's so powerful. But in extending the practice then of emotional agility, what you're also saying is, what are my difficult emotions here signposting? You know, my difficult emotion, my emotions signpost my values. My emotions signpost my values. So to go back to that example, I'm feeling shut down in this conversation. <laughs> you know, about, about finances as an example, but it could be anything else. And I'm feeling activated and I'm noticing that this is my urge to shut down. There is then such power in saying, what is this difficult emotion signposting about what is important to me? And it might be that that difficult emotion is signposting that this conversation is coming up against your value of autonomy you know that that somehow in the conversation you feel like you are having your autonomy threatened or that this is a value around fairness that is being threatened so this is really important because this is then how we step into the power of the conversation which is not about just, okay, now I'm going to shut down and be quiet and I'm going to try to have the conversation again. It allows me to say to the person, to be in context and to say, you know, autonomy is really important to me. And I recognize that when we have this conversation, when we have this interaction, that's what I'm running up against. Or this feels unfair and this is important. And so this is again where you're not being held or maneuvered or manipulated 
by a past experience, but rather you are stepping into your values and stepping into the present. Yes, yes. And I think, you know, ultimately your work, my work, the work that, you know, we're, we're showing up to do and is to empower, is to empower, right, that, that stepping into, that acknowledgement, wow. that, that awareness that we are, you know, full creatures that as the result of many different experiences are living in very conditioned ways, again, just using yes. the language for, yes. for the community here, right, and that ultimately it, it's safer there. Change is very difficult to actualize change, to grow into our fullness. There are reasons, there are patterns. There is a story that one could say we are telling day in and day out in these very oftentimes reactive ways yeah. and disempowered ways and powerless ways that we're showing up. And I was having a giggle um, in terms of this core value because things aren't coincidental. I, as much as I could say, oh, I don't know why I'm you know, <laughs> upset in this moment, what I've now learned of doing my own investigation, exploration, witnessing is for me, all roads lead back to whether I'm upset over dishes not being done or me not being heard in a conversation, all roads lead back to my value around having my voice and my experience yes. honored, coming yes. from a very deeply wounded place where I didn't feel that, I didn't feel fully attuned to in my family unit. So again, whether it's dishes left out, I'm upset, why? Because in that moment, I don't feel like my voice was considered just as much as I'm upset in a conversation with my partner for yeah. somewhat of the same reason. I could be you know, surprised by the upset in both of those areas, or I could do the practical work, I could dive in, I can explore, what is going on in each of these moments? What value, to use your language, is being challenged? And for me, I've uncovered one of my deepest values because it wasn't met in my childhood yes. is being seen, yes. is having my voice and my emotions considered. So I will fight tooth and nail to make sure that happens. And when it doesn't, I become very reactive. Of course, yeah. becoming reactive is not the way to get one's voice heard yes. right so we peel back the onion and from yes. that wounded space i can understand i understand my value i've been able to have difficult conversations and been able to now actualize that value in real time how can i have myself heard so that i don't become reactive and i just like to share that example because yeah. when we dive down a lot of us are having this one value or this one wound that is showing up all over the place as points of reactivity but it's coming from that same space. It's so you, you, it's you make such a powerful observation, and and it's something that that I've spoken to in other parts of my work, which is what's really interesting is the very act of being owned by your thought emotional story, even if that thought emotional story relates to a value. So in your instance, in your experience, your voice. When we owned, we actually get in our own way of that value. So in, in, it's, it's like such a kind of paradox, mm -hmm. which is in the state of being reactive, you almost shut out any capacity for the person to genuinely hear your voice. Yeah. And I, I, you know, you shared one of your core values. I'll share that my, one of my core values is, is autonomy. And the same kind of situation as, as, you know, anyone who watches my TED Talk will know. And I don't completely share all the details in that TED Talk um, because it was a 16-minute talk. But this very difficult experience of the impact of losing a parent at a young age growing up in um, a very particular community and then the after effects of what felt to me like a complete loss of autonomy and so almost every aspect of when I run into difficulty is autonomy and what's funny is that is that what that can lead to me you know if, if I feel like my autonomy is being threatened is I become resistant I dig my heels in I you know do all of those things but what's really fascinating is I am not now acting with my own autonomy you know it's rather the story again that is owning me and is is taking my autonomy so it's just it's a, just a really interesting observation I think I think it's very powerful for people to be kind of connecting in with 
again, this idea of I can show up to my difficult thoughts, emotions, and stories, but they are data, not directives. What I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to not act into my emotions or react into my emotions, but rather to step into and respond into my values. And I think that's that, you know, when you talk about action, that's the action. That is, that is the work of moving forward. Yes. yes, I think this is a beautiful place. I'm going to highlight this last sentence, right? Action into, lean into, live into our values, right? I'm of the belief that they've existed since we came here, right? There's this inner space, this inner knowing, this full self that as you know, our full conversation has been unpacking all of the ways that we yeah. aren't showing up in full connection, integration, and service of, though it's there. Um, and learning how to lean into those values, that way of being, embrace right the fullness that is us. That is what your work is about. Um, I love, like I said, how you you share so much of yourself, your story, and the practical. The okay, how do we translate this? How can I see these concepts in action? Mm -hmm. um, I know that our listeners have probably gained so much value um, from what you've shared here today. Um, it's been truly an honor. Like I said, Dr. Susan David, I've been watching your work. I've been inspired by your work um, since I since I met it. I forget how long ago that was. So I'm truly honored um, to have spent the time with you today. Um, before we end, if you can. Let us know, anyone listening um, from the YouTube channel, who, where to find you, where to find your book, Emotional Agility, um, where to keep connected with you. Yeah, so I wanted to just say the feeling is mutual. Thank you for the, I think, the, the language and the capacity that you are enabling and that, that is being enabled at a collective. I think it's just so powerful. Uh, for anyone who wants to connect with me, I'm on all the different social media channels, Susan David. My website is susandavid.com and I've got a free uh, quiz there that about 150,000 people have taken now, which is really uh, asking just a couple of questions about emotional agility. And from that, you get a free 10 page report. A lot of people find that really helpful. Um, my TED talk, which is on the gift and power of emotional courage. And then my book, Emotional Agility. Awesome. Thank you. We'll make sure all of that is linked up um, so that you guys can find your way to Dr. Susan David. I definitely suggest all of her work and all of the forms. Her book is amazing. Um, definitely go over, follow her work um, and stay connected. And thank you again, Susan, for your time here today. Thank you.